Anywhere, questions? Yes, go darling, give me the mic. Hello everybody, okay, got you. Thank you, go. So I am new to studying Buddhism. You got, sweetheart? I'm new to studying Buddhism. Okay. Um, just a few months or so, four months maybe. Yeah. And uh, I've been doing a lot of reading at home. Yes. And studying. And one of the things that comes up for me in my readings quite often is the importance of having a guru to teach you. Okay, yes. And I don't really understand that, how that works in our Western society or, uh, I yeah. I understand, darling. It's sort of like, I know it's just, it's again, you see, it's the way, it's because the Tibetans talk in a certain way. They're very arcane. You know, Buddhism was intact in, in, in Tibet across the other side of the mountains, untouched by anybody. And when you hear Tibetans talk in the way they frame everything, even when it's spoken in Western terms, it still sounds very old fashioned and strange, like odd language. But basically it's saying, if you want to learn yoga properly, you need a damn teacher. If you want to learn math, you need a teacher. If you want to learn music, you need a teacher. Would you agree with that? That's all a guru means. It's a fancy word for teacher. So you need a teacher. So, okay, that means here, of course, you see, that's okay. When we think, I think in general, we think of spiritual teachings. I don't know what we quite mean by it, but what do you think it means? What do you think spiritual teachings mean? And what are you wanting to get out of this? Where are you going with all this? What do you think? Tell me. I'm not sure which question to address there. Um, are you asking me what I want to get out of studying Buddhism? Yeah, what do you yeah, what do you want from it? What do you think so far, what do you think it means to you? And what do you think the goal of it all is? Why are you doing it? What is it you want from it? Sure. What, what do so you think I feel saying? like since I was a very young child, I can remember even at the age of six. Yeah. I have been really on a quest and a desire, a passion for having a spirituality to my there life. You go. How interesting. And I have studied many different religions and none of them have really met uh -huh. what I felt like I was needing I until I finally started yeah. uh -huh. learning about Buddhism. Okay. And I feel like, oh, I have finally made it home. That's interesting. So you feel that? Yes, I okay. feel it. And every day I meditate, I cry while I meditate. And I just feel like someone is embracing me and saying, welcome home. Wow. Amazing. So this is my passion now. Okay, amazing. And so um, as I read and I'm trying to learn, I understand yes. that guru probably means teacher. That's all, spiritual teacher. And it's a lovely sound. I think I've heard it means heavy with qualities. I yes, there, some of the books have, like list all the qualities you want to look for in a guru yeah, and so go. on. And so I guess my question really is, you know, how do you find such a person? I understand that. I yeah. understand. Well, again, I always have to, I just have to use ordinary examples. So if you were talking about yoga and they give all the list of the qualities of a good yoga teacher, I mean, it's sort of fairly evident. You'd start going to yoga classes and you'd have this list in your head and you'd be checking you go to yoga classes you, and, and especially, you know, you'd, you'd um, I mean, there's various ways they say it. it's sort of reasonable too. You'd, you'd, you know, you'd check the teachers, you'd listen to them, you'd check their students. That's a good, that's proof of the pudding, isn't it? You'd check the quality of the students. You'd check to see what their reputation is like. This is the only way you can check because you have no direct experience. That's why for me, I always use the example. I, it sounds like silly, but it really is very, very, it's very similar. I always use the example when I first learned to make a cake, it sounds ridiculous, but it's the same principle you'll see. And that was when I was about 26, not when I was six, 26. And I was a hippie living in London. I remember the moment. And it, in a way, it's the first time that I ever decided I want to make a cake. So the very first step is you've got to know what you want. So you're finding this, you're looking, you're very consciously knowing what you want. And you've stumbled across this seemingly. It's because you've done it before, honey. That's the Buddhist view. You've got the karmic connection with it. And so I know I, it was the first time I decided and I thought I'm going to make a carrot cake. So I happened to be going home to Australia anyway. So I thought I'd ask my mum. Now, this is my point. Not because I was going to make my mum happy, because I'd done my due diligence. I'd eaten her cake. Cakes. I'd eaten her students' cakes, my sisters. Her peers said she was a good cake maker. So without thinking of it like that, I'd done my due diligence. I'd checked up. So in that sense, I was confident that my mother was a valid cake maker. I checked. And why would I need to do that? Because I don't have any direct experience of cakes. And if she started saying to me, if somebody started saying, well, put you, you put 14 eggs in, I wouldn't know if they were right or wrong. So you have to check the person's reputation and the students. And that's what I'd done. So I asked my mother how to make a cake. I'm sure she was happy. She'd probably waited 20 years for me to ask her. 
you know, she didn't force me because I didn't want. So you had to want it. And then I asked her. And this is what's interesting. All the conditions came together. And so then I never forget that cake. It wasn't a carrot cake. It was an apple and walnut cake. I remember the day, the kitchen. It's in my memory, you know. But why? It's because that's the first time cakes became real for me. So that's the benefit of the teacher. I could have read a book, but the, the human being, which is what the guru means, is the embodiment of those qualities. So how you, you're you doing everything right. So you just keep going. You come to classes. You go on Zoom these days. You listen to teachings. You literally check up who you like, who resonates for you. That's what you're doing. And you're doing it. So just keep doing it. And you'll come across the people, the style. I mean, there's many styles of Buddhism. So many, you know, Tibetan Buddhists. And within that, there's so many. And you'll eventually find your connections. So, of course, the Buddhist explanation is you've got a karmic connection from having met before. And you'll recognize again. You'll you'll come across them. You don't, you know, you don't sort of, you're not looking for a person ex consciously. But the ones that you've got a connection with, you created the cause from the past. So, you're going to bump into them again, guaranteed. So, honey, child, just keep going. Keep practicing, keep using your intelligence, keep listening, keep thinking, and you'll meet your teachers. You're creating all the causes. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Good, darling. So keep moving. Keep moving. And then, then you know, that's like, yeah, that's it. Keep moving. You're doing all the right things. You're enjoying the process, right? Well done, girl. Fantastic. And then when you do meet... You check up because a lot of people, you see, I think with spiritual teachings, we tend to think that, well, anybody can say anything that they like and you can believe what you like. We don't give it much, too much rigor and discipline, but an analysis, but it's really the Buddhist view is very serious. You check really carefully. If someone says they're a Buddhist, you can't just make it up. You can't just pretend you're a Buddhist and make up what you think Buddhism is. It's got to be valid. And so even if you come to a place like this, you should check its reputation, check if it has proper people coming to teach because a lot of wacko people out there. Do you understand? And we and just do your due diligence. It's very sensible. You need to do that. Very important. And then you really check the teachers. You check carefully. And then when you really feel comfortable and ready, you request the teacher. You request people to be your teacher. You'd request. These days, a lot of that happens online because people, you know, you might meet a person, you know, you're watching Zoom and you do a course and there's some teacher in England. You might discover that's your teacher. You know, these days, Zoom, you're meeting people all over the world, you know. So just keep moving, sweetheart. Good. What else, people? So this topic, I've got a feeling we should talk more like on the, well, let's just talk about the compassion wing. We've got the wisdom wing and the compassion wing. And we've been talking the wisdom wing this morning, all the nuts and bolts of the teachings. I mean, maybe we, well, maybe we should talk more about karma. I don't know. Maybe we should. No, we'll, okay, let's look at this. We'll go, we'll, we'll sit. let's look at the compassion wing how we help others, but in relation to the wisdom wing. And this is the important part. You see, if you look at the teachings, you know, from the, the presentation, the Tibetan presentation known as this Lam Rim, the stages of the path, it's presented in a very coherent kind of, uh, co you know, um, kind of coherent step-by-step -step approach, which is like any body of knowledge. If you study music, you start at the simplest stuff, you go to the middle and you get to the more advanced. It's logical. Every body of knowledge is like that. So the first practice, the first level is this, what we're discussing this morning, controlling your body, controlling your speech, knowing your mind, really being your own therapist, working on yourself, having a daily practice, putting yourself together, unpacking and unraveling your own mind. And then you are the beneficiary of that. But one of the other consequences is because you're lessening neuroses and you're lessening delusions, you're also breaking down the barriers that ego constructs between self and other so naturally, you're going to start opening your eyes and looking around and going, oh, my God, we're all in the same boat. So now we're ready to start looking at the compassion wing, which is helping others. But the whole point here is this. It's just like anything. If you decide you want to help people with nutrition, you see all the unhealthy people in the world, you can't just rush out and cross your fingers and hope for the best. You've got to first learn nutrition for yourself. It's really obvious. If you want to t teach people music, You've got to know music yourself. So if you want to teach people how to be more loving and less neurotic, you've got to know how to do it yourself. It's really obvious, but sometimes we don't think like that. We rush out and we try to have compassion and help others, but why we get dragged down and get exhausted because we don't know our own minds enough because we haven't got a basis, you know. So crucially in the Buddhist view, that basis is, is also including the whole concept of karma, which is unbelievably necessary to understand. 
if karma is not taken seriously, it's it, okay. It's the absolute. It's the. It's like in the infrastructure of the Buddhist view itself. It's fundamental to the Buddhist view of re, of reality of how things exist. And if if we can, you know, disprove karma, then the whole of Buddhism collapses into a heap of incoherent nonsense. It's fundamental to it. It's completely in the start of it. It's underneath it. It's within it, and everything is related to it. You know, it's crucial. So, okay, so you want to help others. That means have compassion. Well, what's compassion? Like we asked this morning, what is compassion? Well, it's basically the bare bones is you see someone else suffering and you have empathy. Oh, my God, look at that suffering, you say. That's compassion. So what we're trying to do on the compassion wing is grow that plus all the other virtuous states of mind, love and compassion and kindness and generosity and forgiveness, all of those that are the positive states of mind. You know, they're all related to others. So if you say you want compassion, that means you have to know what it is, which is empathy for somebody who's suffering. But crucially, you have to know the meaning of suffering. But And this is where, where our problem is, in our view in the world, we have a very limited view of suffering. So we have to go back to the basics, which is in the wisdom wing, where we learn Buddha's Four Noble Truths. The very first teaching Buddha gave, you know, was it, it was all framed in terms of suffering. He's telling us that there is suffering. And, there, and he says there are three levels. We'll go into this. The second is, well, guess what, folks? There is There are causes of suffering. And then he says, well, you know what? There is the possibility to be free of suffering. And the fourth one is the methodology, how to do it. It's very practical. It's extensive, goes into great detail, but the logic of it is evident, you know? So if you, the very first level of practice, the wisdom wing, Buddha's talking to you. There is suffering, and he identifies your suffering. And then he says that these are the causes of your suffering. And then he shows you that it's possible to be rid of it. And then he shows you how to do it. It's for you. So you put this into practice for you. And this is what is the basis for your ability to have compassion for others. Because you realize, like I said, they're in the same boat as me. Oh, my God. So that means what I've understood about karma and the causes of my suffering is the same for everybody. So the very first step, then, if you want to develop real compassion is know what suffering is. The Buddha has these three levels of suffering. So the first one, which is the only one we think of, is, he calls it actually the suffering of suffering, in your face suffering. Basically, it's when the bad things happen. And that's all we think of as suffering, isn't it? When we look at the world or ourselves, it's when the, you know your husband leaves you, you hurt your knee, bad things happen, you're poor, you get sick, wars. This is what we mean by suffering. It's when the bad things happen. Isn't it? That's what we mean. And we can see it for ourselves. So Buddha's telling us right at the beginning, guess what, Rabina, there are causes of this. And of course, the shocking part is he's telling us there are two main causes of my suffering and they're both inside me. This is the one that's the shockingest one initially to us, you know, the two main causes. There are many causes. A suffering, a moment of suffering is the same as anything, a cup, a computer. It's a thing that exists and it happens to have many causes. So to know how to make a computer, you better know the causes. If you have a problem with your computer, you better know the causes. If you are sick, you better know the causes. Otherwise, you can't find the solution. So everything is a result of causes. You know, everything is dependent to rising. Everything has causes. So if you identify a problem which is the first one, there is suffering, a problem, you know, you have to know the causes. Then that implies the solution. This is crucial. So for the Buddha, his, his finding, his experiential direct own finding is that, you know, the two, there are hundreds of causes of anything, but there are two main causes of a moment of suffering, two main causes of a moment of happiness, same logic. And they are both inside me. This is the part that's quite shocking to us. That means, <clears throat> you know, the past one, the, the first one is called karma. It's a shorthand for meaning an action that I did in the past in this mind stream of mine, necessarily in a past life, because this is the fundamental teaching in Buddhism about the nature of mind. It's not the handiwork of mummy and daddy. It is not the handiwork of a creator. It doesn't come from nothing. So the only other, you know, the only other option is that the mind comes from previous moments of itself. It's the simplest way to put it. 
So this moment of my mind now comes from the previous moment of mind, which came from the previous moment, which goes back to yesterday. It's an unbroken chain of mental moments that you track back to the first second of conception. And sure enough, the second before conception, the egg was in mummy's body, sperm was in daddy's body. Where was your consciousness? A moment before that of its own self, its own continuity of moments. And a few weeks before that, your mind was in another body. And a life before that, your mind was in another body. And your life before that, and it keeps going. This is the Buddha's observation. So this is the one thing about mind. And then secondly, the law of karma, this natural law of cause and effect, is this natural law. Remember this view, it's crucial. There's no such concept in Buddhism as God's law, equivalent of God's law. We have a very strong view that religion is, religion is God's law. And that is the Christian teaching. And I'm not complaining, but it's not Buddha's teaching. The Buddha's view is there's no boss, there's no creator. We don't need creating, we create ourselves. The law of karma, His Holiness said, is like self-creation. That every millisecond of what I think and do and say in the past has programmed my mind. This is a great analogy. They talk about seeds and fruits, but Buddha would like the view of programming. Every millisecond of what we thought and said and done programmed our mind or sowed seeds in our mind. And then the second of conception in our new mother's womb in this life, we come fully programmed with our own tendencies. The karmic seeds from the past that produce our personality, that produce our experiences and produce even the way the physical environment impacts upon us. There are four ways that karma ripens. So all the happy experiences we have are the fruit of our past virtuous actions. All the unhappy experiences we have are all the fruit of our past non-virtuous actions. It's not a complicated concept, but it's just too shocking to us. We don't think like this. We are the product of our own past. We are the creator of our own present. It's a very amazing view. And the experiential implication of this view, of course, is that you're responsible and you are in charge. You are the boss. You're not some victim who didn't ask to get born to whom good and bad things happen randomly, which is how we tend to think, you know. No wonder we suffer. We are the boss. I think that's a great view. So with the view of karma, then, the Buddha is saying my suffering and indeed my happiness are the fruit of my two main things. One, my past action. And in the case of a moment of suffering is the first, the action has to have been a negative action that harmed another in the case of a complete action. Second, driven by a delusion, karma and delusion. Delusion is a term used to refer to the neurotic states of mind. So any action I've done driven by an attachment or anger or whatever, that sows seeds in my mind, programs me. Let's say an action of past harming another. Let's say killing another or lying to another, whatever. That so seeds in my mind that creates also intense karmic connection with that person. Karma's pretty personal. I meet them again. And at some point, the karma ripens and they harm me back, simply speaking. So the two main causes of my suffering, this first level of suffering, is me my past action and my delusions. And you flip it over, the main causes of my happiness are my past action driven by a virtuous state of mind. This is the simple law of cause and effect. And Buddha says this is the natural law. He didn't make it up. He didn't create it. He's not speculating. He's not the boss. It's a natural law like botany or gravity. It's a natural law and he happens to have observed it. That's the point in Buddhism. And he says this is what he's observed to be so. So you identify the first moment of suffering. You then see the causes. And because you don't want it in the future, you stop creating more causes. That's the teaching from it. So then when you have this for yourself, this is what you start to get. They call it renunciation. You want to give up suffering and its causes. You will renounce suffering and its causes. But what we would call it is self-compassion. We'd call it that. You realize you are sick of suffering. You, I'm sick of suffering. So I know now the causes of it and I don't want it again. So I'm going to stop causing it. So it's just like you get, you know, you, you, you go to your doctor and you're, you're getting diabetes and you're sick of the suffering of diabetes. She tells you the cause. You don't want future diabetes. So you stop the causes because you're sick of suffering. That's the thing that drives the first level of practice. It's like compassion for yourself. So then once you got that down, now you look at the rest of the world and go, oh my God, look at this. Look at the people suffering. This is the first level of suffering. And that's the one we do have compassion for. But our trouble is we have compassion for the, for the poor dog getting kicked and we have compassion for the poor people and we have compassion for the people in the war zone. But we, the next second, we look at who's to blame. You know, how dare that guy, hit that dog, poor innocent dog. How dare those wicked people drop bombs on those innocent people. And then our compassion turns into anger or confusion or depression, you know, and that's the big mistake.
The Buddha says we are all in the same boat. Every millisecond, every sentient being, every hell being, every spirit, every human, every animal, every millisecond is only can only be experiencing the fruits of what they have done. So the idea, which is the Western view, the materialist view, forgive me, the materialist view, that you, someone can be the main cause of your suffering is a very bizarre concept in Buddhism. We have to be playing a role in it. If it happens to you, you must have played a role in it. If it happens to you, you must have caused it. It wouldn't happen to you otherwise. If you don't sow the seed in your garden, you won't get the fruit. If you see the fruit there, you sowed the seed. So this really takes a while. But once we do take this on board as our hypothesis, you know, it's too, we're not subtle enough to prove it to be true yet from direct experience, but it's the theory we observe and take as our view, then it, it really makes radical change in our lives because we start to interpret our life like this. We then own responsibility. We don't become such a victim. It lessens attachment. It lessens anger. It lessens despair. And then when we start to see the world, it, it increases our compassion, but not just for the dog. The bodhisattvas have more compassion for the guy who kicks the dog. Why? Because they've set up this karmic relationship. The dog, as a result of his passing and harming in the past, is now being harmed. And this guy, due to his harming the dog, so the dog is just finishing its karma, but the guy kicking the dog is just beginning its suffering. So you have even more compassion for the harmer. This is intense. It does not fit with the way we think at all. There's no, no concept of anger there. It's only compassion. But you can't have that level of compassion if you haven't done it for yourself. And this is the first level of suffering. Now, the second level of suffering is very depressing to us because it's what we call happiness. And this, we need to really just squeeze our brains to understand this one. It sounds so weird in the beginning. So the second kind of suffering Buddha calls it the suffering of change. And this is the experience we all can know. We we're discussing it before. Let's look at this one. <clears throat> so in general, what we call ha suffering, like I said, is when the bad things happen. And in general, what we call, call happiness is when the good things happen. And that's a pretty basic thing. We can see it. And the whole world is driven by the wish to be free of the suffering and driven by the wish to have the happy things. So that's what drives everybody's decisions. Dogs and ants and monkeys and humans. We go towards the things and events that we think will give us happiness and we move away, try to move away from the things and events that we think will cause suffering. So where all of our lives are driven by the craving to be happy and the craving to be free of suffering, this first level. So what we call suffering in our world is the bad things. And we call happiness is when the good things happen. But the Buddha is saying, if you look at it in a more, you know, more nuanced way, it's actually a deeper, more subtle level of suffering. And this takes time to see. So let's see if we can analyze it and see the logic of it. Notice here it is punitive and Buddha being mean, you know. So how, why is a moment of happiness suffering? Well, the way it's, it's sort of fairly evident, you know. So there you are feeling kind of something's missing. So it's your stomach. Or well, you think it's your stomach. Oh, what's missing? Or they go, oh, I'll have a cake. So attachment starts, you know, kicking in. And first of all, the, the dissatisfaction was there. And now you think the cake and you get all excited. So attachment exaggerates the deliciousness of the cake and starts anticipating the cake. And you get the cake and it's on the plate and you're building up all the anticipation. And all you're anticipating is that pleasure that will come, that moment of pleasure. This is another whole discussion. We've got to analyze pleasure and, and suffering, what they mean. This is a very precise point. We'll go there in a minute. So that there's a moment of pleasure that we know will come because you've had the cake before. You know what it's like. You remember the feeling. And you want that again. But more instinctively, you just want satisfaction. The pain of that feeling of not having enough, not being enough. You want the hole to be filled up. You want it to go, the pain to go away. So you think, oh, good, cake will do it. So, okay, what happens is this. There is the moment, there is the suffering of having an empty stomach, put it that way, something missing. So then you, then you go to get the cake and you put the cake in the mouth. It meets the, the consciousness, the tongue consciousness. So it does trigger a happy feeling, there's no doubt. It does trigger a happy feeling. That's one part of the mind. Attachment is another part of the mind. They're separate parts, but they all seem to come together. So there is a happy feeling triggered. It's a fact. But Buddha's saying... 
so, no, forget Buddha. No, we'll, we'll discuss Buddha. What he says, let's look at this, but we'll see it's true. So what happens is this. That moment, the, the first moment, the first piece of cake, the first mouthful, actually, if you look back, is the most delicious. It triggers the best pleasure. But so you've got to ask yourself, what is it about that moment of pleasure that wasn't enough? And it's not, because that second you have that pleasure, attachment is still there. Attachment has been driving the whole process. Attachment is first dissatisfaction. Then, then attachment grabs onto the cake. Then attachment uh, uh, um, anticipates the cake. Then you do all the job to get the cake. And then attachment's right there as you put the cake in the mouth, right there, pleasure is triggered, and attachment says, Rabina, that's not enough. I'm not satisfied yet. And so, oh, oh, all right, then I better have another mouthful. So the, the feeling is satisfaction will come in a minute with the second mouthful. So the, it doesn't come. So attachment saying it's not enough again. Dissatisfaction, it's not enough. I'm sorry, I'm not satisfied yet. So you have to have a third mouthful. And we all know what happens. We all know what happens. Already the pleasure, if you're analyzing carefully, the pleasure is diminishing. You can't better think about it. It's too depressing because you're not satisfied yet. So you desperate attachments convinced if another piece might do it, save a second piece of cake, desperately waiting for the happiness to come. But you're seeing it going downhill in front of your face. You look at the cake, it looks more ugly. It doesn't smell so delicious. You've had three pieces. The pleasure has gone. And now what is left is the exact opposite of pleasure. You want to vomit. That is called unhappiness. That is called suffering. We all know this experience. It's not being mean. This is the analysis to do, to prove the Buddha's point is that what we call happiness, he says it's the suffering of change because that moment of happiness, we're not satisfied with it. We want, we think it's not enough. We want more, but it doesn't come. So not only do we not get satisfaction from eating the cake, we get more dissatisfaction and we have to, when then we crave it even more the next day. We know this but it's too unbearable to see it. So then where is the pleasure then? Because you see, we want pleasure to last. We, we desperately all the time hoping pleasure, happiness will last. So when you find the boyfriend, you say, finally, I found happiness. We're sort of so excited that we've now got it and we're going to lock it in and keep it. Finally, I've got happiness. Finally, I found the best job. Finally, I'm happy. Finally, my body's the right shape. But we know it doesn't last. And what doesn't last is it because it's just the nature of things to change. And then dissatisfaction kicks in and is never satisfied and it wants more or another. So it's this terrible nightmare of looking for something that having cakes cannot bring. Boyfriends can't bring it. $42 billion can't bring it. It's not moralistic. It's not saying you shouldn't have boyfriends or cakes. It's not saying that. It's trying to see the reality of the experience that they are not the cause of happiness. They cause some moment of happiness, but because it's dependent upon getting the next mouthful of cake, it won't last. It won't last. So the very thing that we think caused the pleasure is the same thing that caused you wanting to, wanting to vomit. We know this is true, but it's too painful to, front, to confront it, you know. So pleasure, happiness are states of mind. There's two kinds. There's a, there's a state of mind that's the sensory pleasure. So it's true when the cake meets the tongue, it triggers sensory pleasure. You know, and there's equally this pain. When the toe, you stub your toe, there's sensory pain. But then there's mental happiness and there's mental suffering. These are very different from attachment and aversion, but we mix them all like in a big soup. What we're wanting to develop is happy feelings, happiness. Sensory, they, they won't last, but mental, mental pleasure, joy, fulfillment, contentment, happiness, and the cause of that is giving up delusions and practicing virtues. It's mental. It's mental. Not, not sensory. Are we communicating? Yeah. Is that a question? Go, sweetheart. Yes, you, darling. Give the man the mic. Uh, Speaking to the mic is better. 
No, I was just, uh, you had these examples right now of like finding a boyfriend and finding a job. Yes. Aren't those actually mental? Speak closer to the mic, sweetheart. I can hear you better. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. So the finding the boyfriend or the finding the uh, yeah, job. Yes. Aren't they mental too? Because what, darling? they're also mental feelings of joy, right? It's not, sens it's not sensory. But are you saying that the mentary, mental ones last more than the sensory? What I'm saying is, no, what I'm saying is, um, Buddha's, okay, okay, different things, different things. Buddha's point, Buddha's main point is that he has found the methods to develop mental, yeah, mental, mental pleasure, mental happiness, mental joy, fulfillment, contentment, joy, and then to, to degrees that we can't even imagine. Forget the long-term one, but just even short-term. And the method for doing that, the method for becoming joyful, and be the key method is to practice in the mind lessening attachment, lessening anger, lessening jealousy, lessening doing negative actions that sow seeds in our mind and growing virtue, growing goodness, growing, growing kindness. It's a very conscious Con conscious process that's the main cause in the, to bring long term the state of happiness and joy that's what he's saying now given that we live in relation to others and food and people then there is a way we can learn to have your boyfriend and have your have your cake and have your and eat it too to have your boyfriend and get pleasure but it comes from practicing virtue so if we just think the cake is the, only the sensory experience, you will never get happiness from that. It'll be too temporary. Even the best boyfriend on the planet won't last because it's a very intense experience. You know, if we think of the sexual one, it's a very intense experience of pleasure, but it's the same as the cake. It doesn't last. So we think that only, then no wonder we're all bereft. But if you do have a relationship, then you learn to practice love and kindness in that relationship. And that's what brings the pleasure and happiness. It's hard work. Do you understand? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So more than pleasure is peace uh, or... What, sweetheart? You, basically, you, probably you meant peace. The ment When you said mental feelings is what you're looking for, like, or what's lasting, you probably meant uh, the, the, the difficult kind, what you just mentioned, the kindness, the peace. Like the peace is what you mean. Peace, I mean yeah, yeah. peace always sounds a bit boring, doesn't it? It means contentment, fulfillment, oh, yeah. not anxious, not worried, not neurotic, not depressed. Yeah. You know, not ugly and miserable, but peaceful, meaning content. And that level of joy, that level, Buddha talks, this is where it's encouraging to hear that our minds have this potential. And the Hindus, the genius Hindus found this before the Buddha even, you know. So I remember Lama Yeshi in his book, Mahamudra, he's always so kind to try and encourage us modern people to know we've got this marvelous potential for happiness, basically happiness. So the thing is, he, he talks about some, just some of the consequences of getting what they call single point of concentration. If you practice this technique, these genius Indians invented, that's a key technique in Buddhism called, you know, shamatha, calm abiding, where you've learned to really harness the crazy energy of your mind and you've got it to a subtler level where you get, you know, single pointed concentration. One of the key consequences of this is levels of joy that you can't even imagine at an ordinary level. And it's not trying to sound cosmic, but in other words, the, the Buddha is saying that even just temporarily, the degree to which you can completely subdue the grosser levels of conceptuality and sensory consciousness, you, when you access your subtler level, the degree of utter joy is unimaginable. But it's not greedy joy. It's totally peaceful joy. Everybody who's ever had any even a taste of it in meditation will say, you know, the pleasure we get now is very desperate. Even if it's a glass of water when you're thirsty, it's kind of greedy, you know. But if you have pleasure at the mental level, it's totally peaceful, totally nothing to do with the senses. And that's our potential. So it's good to know that our minds have this marvelous potential. Do you understand? And I remember one of my friends, our, Venom, our friend Venom Rene, some of you must know him, he must teach here. Yeah. I interviewed him back in the mid-90s about one of his first serious long-term retreats. And he was practicing getting single pointed concentration, which, as you know, in the texts is described in terms of nine stages of development. And he said something like, no question that the pleasure, the joy, pleasure, joy, bliss, ecstasy, happiness, they're all variations of the same thing, a happy mind, right? The pleasure that he experienced just in his mind 
was so superior to any pleasure he'd ever experienced through his senses. That's, that's encouraging to know this. And that's where we have to make this distinction between sensory experience and mental. So, you know, for example, for example, you stub your toe, that is a sensory experience. It's a pain. But what happens is because we have attachment to not having pain, we then get angry and we assume the anger is a natural response to the pain. Well, of course I'm angry. I stub my toe, we will say. Well, no, not of course. That's just a pain. But we can then, that's why we can learn to, to know that the sensory is one thing, but the mental response called anger is another. So bad enough, I think it's bad enough having a pain in your toe, why be angry as well? But we assume they're linked. We assume that when you have a piece of cake, we, that's another way of putting it, we assume when a piece of cake that, that satisfaction will come. But satisfaction is not, you can say your stomach is satisfied, but you've got to train yourself to stop eating the cake. Because if you keep waiting for satisfaction, you'll never stop eating till you vomit. So you've got to train yourself to have one piece and know your stomach is okay. But you've got to practice that because it's a mental decision. I'm going to stop eating cake and learn to be content. You have to practice thinking, I'm content. I've had enough. You've got to train because the senses run the show. We keep stuffing ourselves with food. I mean, as a kid, I had no idea that you know, I just assumed satisfaction was what you get when you couldn't eat any more food. I'd stuff myself until I was full. Do you understand? And that's where the tragedy of attachment is. I always remember one of those, you know, those television shows about people who overeat. And this little girl was like 400 pounds, you know. And her mother, it was so poignant. Her mother said, oh, she's always been like this. She never felt full. That's what drives us. That's what attachment is. You're just never satisfied. Your stomach is completely full. But you don't feel full, which means you didn't feel satisfied because you think the cake will bring it, but it doesn't, it can't. You have to train your mind to feel satisfied and to recognize the distinction between the sensory and the mental is a tremendous practice. It opens you up to many things. Do you understand? It's really powerful. Thank you. Go on. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. I have two questions. Good. Uh, I'm trying to understand this karma. That... To the mic again. I'm okay. trying to understand karma. Yes. So what exactly is being reborn and also use the word consciousness? Yes, uh, sure. In, in Theravadan, we use the term vinyana. What's um, that? How do you translate? Uh, vinyana is loosely translated as sense consciousness. Uh, sense consciousness. Yeah, eye consciousness, okay, hearing okay, okay. consciousness. Okay. So I, I was wondering if you meant the same consciousness when you use the word consciousness. Okay, I mean, this is the Buddhist teachings of Theravada or Buddhist teachings of Mahayana, same teachings, and I'm discussing the Theravada teachings here. Maybe we just use different terminology. But what Buddha is saying is, and this is Buddha's teaching, Theravada or anything else, is that your consciousness is, a, is this river, it's like, a, it's like a mental, they talk, mental continuum. So you've got mental consciousness and you've got sensory consciousness. So the mental consciousness is where all your thoughts and feelings are. And so when you die, I mean, it's certainly in the, in the Vajrayana teachings, they go through this process. They describe this deconstruction of all the first, the sensory, and then the grosser levels of the mental until eventually your mind gets to the very subtlest level. And that's what goes to the next life, driven by the karma you've created. That at the time you stop breathing, the karmic seed that will trigger your next rebirth is already triggered. And then your mind eventually becomes more subtle, more subtle, and then it leaves the body. And then eventually the new condition comes along, your new mommy and daddy and karma, your karma drives you to that new, the new egg and sperm. And you take another life and you take a body which has sensory consciousness. And then you have thoughts and feelings and emotions, which is your mental consciousness. This is Buddha's teaching. But Buddha also talks about, uh, you know, three, characteristics of the phenomena, the core phenomena, anicca, anatta, dukkha, uh, right? Anatta is loosely translated as not self. Right, exactly. Because exactly. It, the fundamental difference between Hinduism and Buddhism is that That's right. Hindus exactly. believe that there is an Atman or Atman. Exactly. No, exactly. But Buddhism That's doesn't. Right. So therefore, therefore, then what is getting reborn is there is not. So, okay. Okay. I, the point is perfect. We need to understand this. So, okay. Okay. From the in the conventional world, we can say that things exist conventionally. So you know you agree you agree that's called a thermos. 
You agree that's called an iPad. You agree that's called a, a, an iPhone. You agree this is called a person. You agree you're called a person. You're not an iPad. You're not a phone, right? Or a, a, a thermos. So then you're a person. That's the term referring to a, a being who has a consciousness. You're a mind possessor. You're a consciousness with a body. That's a person. An animal is a person. A bodhisattva is a person. An arhant is a person. They're persons. So person, self, I, me, they're all synonyms. They're all terms referring to a type of phenomenon that has a consciousness. That's what a person is. You So far, we're agreeing. So that person, the components of a person in the ordinary level we see here are a mind and a body. You agree? A mind and a body. So the mind and body are conjoined. And due to past karma, you've got this particular shaped body. Due to karma, an ant, a consciousness turns into, goes to an ant egg and turns into an ant body. Due to karma, another consciousness goes to a lion mother and has a lion body. Due to karma, some consciousness goes into the hell beings and has the, the element of fire being there, basically their body. A god being has their, let me finish. I have to finish. Do you mind? So they're all sentient beings. They're persons. They are persons. They are, self. they are a self. They are an I. They're a person conventionally. So that is what, that's, so that in this life, what's your name? Uh, Vishnu. 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 So this life, your mummy named you Vishnu, I presume. This life. But when your consciousness leaves this body at death, unless you, you know, you become an arhant and you go into nirvana, your consciousness programmed by the karma that Vishnu created will carry on beyond, Vishnu's body will be gone. The person known as Vishnu is gone when you die. But the consciousness that was in Vishnu's body programmed by the karma that Vishnu created and programmed by the karma from the past lives is carried in this consciousness and will take another body. So that is called a self. That person continues, and now you become a person called Mary or a person become dog, whatever. But the, you're a person. So a person goes from life to life. So when Buddha says Atman, no self, he's meaning no intrinsic self, no inherent self, no ultimate self. That's the teachings about emptiness and selflessness. And there's no contradiction. So we have to learn to understand emptiness to understand that point. So to say there's no self doesn't mean you don't exist. That's nihilism. Are we communicating? Uh, yes. So the difficulty I'm having is so then you, uh, the the difficulty I'm having in, in understanding yeah. this is so there are are we saying there are multiple consciousness or there's only one consciousness? No. Who told you that? Where is that? It's not Buddha's teaching at all. There are trillions. Consciousness is another word for mind, and the Buddha says there are countless sentient beings, billions of sentient beings. I mean, there are already twenty in just this room. What's this one consciousness? That's a Christian teaching about God, not the Buddhist view at all. There are billions of consciousnesses. Each has their own karma. Each becomes their own person. Each has their own suffering. Each has their own happiness created by their own personal actions. Look at us in this individuals in this room. There's not one consciousness here. What do you mean by one consciousness? Where did you learn well, that? Uh, so we say non-duality, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> Who's we, darling? Forgive me, Vishnu. I, I, I learned from all traditions. So You learned from what? All traditions. Uh, Good, okay, but I don't know whether this one consciousness is not a Buddhist teaching, Vishnu. Please forgive me. Okay, okay. Go on. Yeah, I'm, what's I'm your question? Understand. Good, what's your question? So, yeah, somehow I feel like this this is a non-dual understanding of this thing. What is? Uh, the consciousness. What? Consciousness. What do you mean non-dual? Understanding of what? Non-dual is Buddhist teaching about no Atman. That's Buddha's non-duality teaching about emptiness. There's no non, that's the eventual goal we are achieving to realize the non-duality. So we get out of samsara. But what recognizes non-duality is mind or consciousness. There's only one. Consciousness, maybe you've got a different definition. It's another word for mind. And that's what defines you as being a person. Your, four, your body is the same four elements as this. But the difference is this is not conjoined with a mind. You are conjoined with a mind, which is your mind programmed by your actions coming from your previous life, which goes back to another previous life, which goes back in a continuity of mental moments for countless eons and will continue going forward for countless eons if you continue to practice karma. So if you follow Buddha's teachings, you're going to get rid of the delusion. You're going to realize non-duality. You'll realize emptiness and you'll get the hell out of, out of samsara and into nirvana. 
uh, at that time, what happened to that mind? Which, what time and what when, which point? Uh, at the time of nirvana. Okay, there are nirvana. different interpretations. The Theravadans say you got, you've disappeared like a puff of smoke. The Mahayana say your mind is now the mind of a Buddha. When you fully develop Buddhahood, your mind pervades the universe and now you manifest in countless bodies to return to this planet and other planets to be of benefit to others. That's the Mahayana teaching. But the Theravadans would say you disappear. So there's different interpretations of Buddhist teachings. Are we communicating in English now? Yes, Do yes, you? yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, just okay. trying to understand the definition of consciousness, I guess. So I that's clear. Your interpretation of consciousness. You're thinking, where did you get the idea of this one con What did you mean by that? Say what you thought. Yeah, yeah. So so I guess, okay. Um, uh, let's say a person A got enlightened uh, and, and the mind disappeared. The person B got enlightened and the mind disappeared. It disappeared into what? Okay, no, that's the Theravadan teaching. That's not the Mahayana view. Yeah, and that's not the way I'd be teaching it here. So the Buddha's view is, okay, the Buddha's view is, we're all separate individual beings right now because of suffering, because of delusions and afflictions. So when you realize emptiness and you achieve Buddhahood and I achieve Buddhahood and she achieves Buddhahood, we became, then where you could say there is only one enlightened mind. That you can say. We all become the same mind. Right now, this dualistic view of separate me's is part of the problem. That's the view of that's the that's the dualistic view. So when we all become Buddha, we become the same Buddha. Our mind pervades the universe. The mind is infinitely powerful, infinitely compassionate, infinitely wise, and then manifests in bodies to be a benefit to others. So there are millions of emanations of different bodies, but there's one essential. The Dharma they call it the Dharmakaya in Sanskrit. There's, when you become enlightened and I become enlightened, we're the same Buddha. Then, if you'd like, you could argue that mind, the same mind. Are we communicating? Yeah, yeah. Now okay, that good. makes a lot, okay, lot, lot more sense. Yeah. Well, yes. More. You had more questions? Uh, just one more go, question. Go, go. So we, we talk about non-killing, yes. uh, right? And and in that context, um, if someone is eating meat, yes, uh, is that... Uh, Same as killing. Oh, no, it's a, it's a very interesting discussion. Okay, let's go into it. It's an important discussion because I think there's so much... Um, yeah, there's an important discussion. So my first point is this, that we always ask it, and everybody's the same and you're the same, we always ask that question in terms of eating the animal's flesh. I've never yet met a person who says, what's the karma of wearing leather shoes? Or what's the karma of using a piece of silk? Or what's the karma of using a an animal's body once it's dead? But I think we always mention food, this is my own opinion, is because we're very attached to food. There's a lot of emotion around vegetarian, killing animals, eating animals. There's a lot of emotion around it. Do you understand my point? So the fact of the matter is, I remember one time on, um, years ago on uh, Facebook, FaceTime, what's it called? Facebook. I put a picture of me in Liverpool in England in this shop where it was a cheese shop and I bought this kick-ass cheddar. Right. And I had a photo and then some fundamentalist vegan person, fundamentalist, you know, likes to tell everybody what to do. How dare a Buddhist nun eat cheese, you know? So I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be political. So I remember thinking, I wonder how many creatures die on the road when you drive cars. So sure enough, someone's done, the, someone's done the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the research. So this Dutch guy, Somehow, it's sort of like he came up with this view that just on the number plate of a car, sort of per kilometre, per car, billions, trillions of little creatures are destroyed. And they are sentient beings. They are creatures, you know. So he, his response to that was, oh, you can't help that. And then I put another story on, even more direct. This one's so shocking. In Australia, some scientists got fed up with all the fundamentalist vegetarians and vegans telling everybody what to do, right? And he said, this is just ridiculous. And he pointed out there's this particular wheat field in near Melbourne, where I come from, where one season, off season, millions of field mice gathered in the wheat field. So they were cute little beings. They, he took photos of them. He said they sang love songs to each other. They were the cutest things. And guess what you do when you want to grow the wheat? 20% for the bulls, for the meat eaters, and 80% for the holy vegans and vegetarians. You slaughter the mice. And they don't, they don't kill them nicely. <coughs> and he said, oh, you can't help that. In other words, we're so obsessed with eating. As soon as if you ate the bugs, you'd be in trouble. If you ate the mice, you're wicked. But if you don't eat it, who cares if they die? It's very bizarre. 
<laughs> so in other words, it's more than just whether or not you eat meat. Creatures die just by our existing. <laughs> I mean, look at the Jains. You know, they don't even, they wear a thing across their mouth. And if you realize there are beings, I mean, our body is a walking zoo. Just under our armpits, it's like a zoo of living beings, you know, living in our body. So we can't, we can't exist without harming others. So the main thing is to be as conscious as we can, that we do whatever we can to not harm sentient beings as much as we can on this crazy planet. So, you know, I, I, and then again, when you go to more detail about it, for example, we tend to think in our culture that demand is what causes the animals to get killed. No, it's the karma as well of the animals, for the animals. So, for example, I remember one time in Maine where they have lobsters, suddenly in one season there were 10 times more lobsters in the waters of Maine than normal. So initially the fishermen were so happy, but of course it deflated the prices. They had suddenly too many damn lobsters and the Maine state government had to spend $10 million selling these wretched lobsters. So nobody invited the lobsters. Nobody ordered more lobsters. They just turned up due to karma. They turned up in the, the water of Maine. So, you know, if, a, if, if they stop killing pigs, then – the people, the pigs who get born as pigs who just get born as chickens. Because if you've got the calm to be born as an animal due to killing, you're going to get born one way or the other, which doesn't mean you become fatalistic and go, I don't care. You do whatever you can to lessen the harm. I mean, the, apparently the meat industry is destroying the planet. I've heard things. That's terrible. So we do what we can not to harm others. And then I would also say that even, you know, it's the motivation. I mean, if a person is a vegan because they're fanatic about being healthy, it's completely samsaric action. There's no virtue in that. Whereas, you know, and all those creatures who died for their holy vegetables, they don't care about them. So it's really very superficial how we think about it. There's more to it than merely not eating or eating meat. So at least be conscious <coughs> and do as much as we can not do things that harm others. And certainly too, out of, out of, you know, I mean, I know I'm attached if I like food, but if you gave me the choice to eat food, you give me, give me meat, please. I'm, I'm just saying what I take the taste. So for me, it's very virtuous to not eat meat because it's it just it's good for my attachment not to eat meat. Do you understand my point? There's more to it than merely eating meat and not eating meat. Much more to it. Do you understand? And again, the main thing too is, you know, you can see clearly that if, you see, karma, okay, let's look into karma more, how we create karma. This is important. Karma is very intricate and very precise. It's not a very general thing. It's very precise. So we, every second we have a thought, and then every second we follow it through with the body or speech, we are programming our mind with those tendencies. So, it's, so an action, for an action, I mentioned it briefly before, but for an action, let's say, called killing, for it to be qualified as a what they call a complete action of killing, which drops a seed into your bank vault, if you like, that becomes a main karmic seed, such that at the time of your death, one of those main karmic seeds of killing would become the cause of a type of rebirth, and the rebirth would be a suffering rebirth, like an ant or an animal or something. But uh, so then the main the main action, and for any karma we do, like say example killing, to qualify as a complete karmic seed which brings future rebirths, there has to be four things in place when you do it. The first is, let's say with killing, simple is the mouse in your kitchen. There's an object there called a mouse, a living being. Second, your mind involved in it. There's two parts there. It's more complex than this, but this is keeping it simple. There'd be the intention, not motivation, but intention, bare bones, volition, I will kill the mouse. And then you look at the, the second part is the motivation. 2A is intention, I will kill the mouse. And then 2B is motivation. So mostly it's disgust, revulsion. How dare a mouse be in my kitchen? So it's not attachment. It's not love. It's not compassion. It's aversion. So then third is you do the action. Fourth, the result, a dead mouse. So roughly speaking, that's a complete action of killing. Do you understand? And that puts a seed into your main bank vault and, you, and then it multiplies and it will ripen as many future suffering types of rebirth. But then it, there's other three other ways that will also ripen in the future as kind of residual results of it. One will be the tendency to keep killing. One will be the experience of being killed. And one will be even the way the physical world impacts upon you. So that would mean, for example, you, you know, you, you killed, 
you get born in the lower realms, you exhaust that karma, and then like a miracle one day, one of your virtuous karmic seeds of non-killing will be triggered and you will then go to a human mother and you're born. I like, always use the example of this one boy who was a fisherman. His mother came in tears to me at one time at Copan, our monastery, and said he'd, he'd been she'd been hearing teachings about karma from Lama Zopa. And her boy, he'd died five years before, um, from scuba diving and he was about 29 and she said he'd been a fisherman all his life and she was hearing these teachings about karma and she was in tears and she wanted to know where he'd be reborn yes and we're talking about him so this is how it works he'd been in the lower realms in the past one of those karmic seeds a complete seed had ripened he got many many suffering rebirths because karma multiplies seeds multiply then eventually that karma ran out but he hadn't purified all aspects of that karma. But nevertheless, he got a human body, which is one of the four results of killing, of, of non-killing. He got a human body, which is the result of non-killing. Second, though, because he hadn't purified all aspects of his past killing, he had the residual results left over, which then ripened in that life as a tendency to kill. He had many other good tendencies. He was kind and loving, but he had a tendency to kill. From the time he was little, someone took him fishing. He saw fishing. He got pleasure from it. He didn't know why. It's because he had the karma with it. And then he got attached to it and he spent his life fishing. He defined himself as a fisherman. He saw himself in terms of fishing. He spent his life killing fish. And this is the tragedy of attachment, but he's so attached to it that he couldn't see the suffering of, that he was causing those fish in that boat. His mother went fishing one time with him. She didn't like fishing, but she didn't want to criticize her boy, you know. So he was attached to fishing. He defined himself in terms of fishing. He couldn't see anything but something pleasurable, which is what attachment, it like painted a delicious picture for him. So he, he saw the same fish as his mother in that boat, but he could never see the suffering because he saw his own fantasy, which is what attachment does. His mother saw suffering because she had no karma to kill. She saw the unbearable suffering of this fish. It was clear the fish didn't want to be in that boat. It was clear they wanted to get out of the boat back in the water. Their little body's flapping. They don't have a voice. Their little eyes are wide. They can't express their feelings, you know, and, the, and he couldn't see suffering. He just saw flapping fish. He saw the fantasy that his attachment painted in his picture due to his habit. This is the worst one. And then the third way karma, karma ripens, the second one in that life, was you get killed or die young. That happened to him. He got killed. He died at the age of 29, scuba diving. And third, the fourth result is a karmic result. The environmental result of killing is that the food and the, and the, and the, and the water and the, and the earth itself, the physical world itself harms you. I mean, that's what COVID, look at COVID. It was the karma of the whole universe, the whole world of killing that we, that we got sick just by looking at each other, by kissing your grandmother, you die, you know? The physical world itself harms you. So the four results of killing, born in the lower realm. Second result of killing, even in a human realm, tendency to kill. You get killed or the environmental result. These are the four results of any action you do, positive or negative. So for, for non-killing, you flip that over. So the difference, this is where vows and come in, the power of vows. The difference between that boy who got a human body, the same as another boy who got a human body, my friend, when she was taking the lice out of his head, this friend of mine, who is a three-year-old boy, he was crying with compassion for the lice. He, in all his life, he's like 40 something now, he's never killed a living being. And, he, and, he, and so he, you can argue that the fisherman boy had been in the lower realms, exhausted his killing karma, but hadn't purified all the rest of it. So he came back in this life and he went straight back to killing. Look at the human realm. Most people kill something. So most humans will go to the lower realms because of it. This is a tragedy because they haven't purified. That's why the power of vows is so intense. But this other boy, compassion for the lice in his own head. He, he hasn't, so he, we can deduce he's lived in vows in the past. So in this life, he had a human body. He had no tendency to kill. He didn't get killed or die young. And the, he had envi the environment was not, not harming him. So if you've lived in vows of not killing and you've done purification of not killing, of killing, you're going to wake up in this life with a human body, no tendency to kill. You won't get killed and you'll be fat and healthy. I mean, who doesn't want that? Bare minimum. Are we communicating here? Yes. Okay. So living in vows and purification are your best practices, I tell you. Then you get ahead of the game, you know. But all this is Buddha's observation. He didn't make it up. He's not the boss. He doesn't run it. He's not a punisher. He's not a rewarder. There is no concept like that. And that's how we hear it. Because we're so, we're so used to the Christian teachings or the Muslim. And I'm being rude. 
I was a very devoted Catholic. But the view there is very clear that God is the boss, that God runs the show, and that God punishes and God rewards. And in fact, this is so powerful, this concept for me, so important. I asked my Christian priest friend, a Catholic priest, a Jesuit, and I asked him, what is by definition, what is a sin? He said, by definition, a negative action or a sin is doing what God said not to do. This is really vital to understand and it's appropriate. So if you have faith in a creator, you don't do that. Not because in itself it's wrong. He said, the priest said, there is some aspect of natural law. People don't like getting killed. But the main thing that makes it wrong is because God said. That's pretty powerful. And I think that's how we think of all religion, including Buddhism. So Buddha says don't kill, just like Jesus. But it's different. The reason is completely different. It's got nothing to do with the fact that Buddha says. Buddha's more like a doctor. Your doctor says, don't smoke, Rabina. And you say, why not? She does not say, because I say so. And she does not say, if you smoke, I'll punish you with cancer. That's our demented view of, of, of morality. It's punishment and reward. And that's how we hear Buddhism. It's so childish. This is a natural law. We get it when it comes to food and cigarettes, but not when it comes to morality. We think someone's punishing and rewarding. So we've really got to think this stuff through. So Buddha says killing is wrong. He says, guess what, honey? People don't like getting killed. It's a natural law. Nothing to do with the fact that he said don't kill. But that's how we hear it. Are we communicating? This is a very important point to get. I'm not criticizing the Christian one. If you want to have faith in a creator, honey, child, you'll have a happy life. You'll do God's will. Nothing wrong. But it's not the Buddha's view. And that's the biggest mistake we make, I think. We just transfer that same view to Buddhism. Buddha's not the bus. He's not a creator. He's not a punisher. He's like a good doctor telling you his experience. He says, I advise you not to do this, otherwise you'll get suffering. And who causes it? You cause your suffering by smoking. You can't blame Marlboro. You understand? It's a really, and then when you have this view of karma, you take responsibility. You grow up, you know. You, become, you can become accountable. But we hear it as punishment and reward. This is our biggest mistake, I tell you. And if we can't get past this, we can't get far with Buddhism. So then happiness is a fruit of my past of actions. My mother used to say, virtue, she's a Catholic, virtue has its own rewards. That's exactly Buddha's point. You create your own happiness and your own suffering by your own mind, your own actions. I think it's the most brilliant view, you know. Are we communicating? Then we can have compassion for others. Because we all think someone else did it to us. We're all demented looking around who caused the suffering, you know, who caused the happiness, whereas it's right here. Wow, I tell you. What else, people? I'm shouting away here as usual. What time is it? What time is it, uh, Bay? What time is it time supposed to go? Okay, can you bear another 45 minutes of me shouting again? We can finish early if you like. Yes, darling, speak. Oh, well done. She's very quick, isn't she? In the morning, she, by the afternoon, she's done it. Pretty good. Wow. <laughs> Compassion and gratitude, have a kindness. You think, as one of the meditations we do on the body, such a part is think of the kindness of your mother. And then, because all, all beings have been your mum, you transfer it to everybody. You start with your mum, because the, the Indians base it on the old-fashioned idea that people like their mums, you know, but we have to deal with the, the maniac modern people who hate our mums. So there's a whole other kettle of fish for us. Just start seeing your good qualities. And no, but the karmic one is so powerful. When you know you've got karma with this person, and to the degree that she's harming you, honey, child, then you must have harmed her. So, you know, it's eggers on your face. When you can have bravery enough to take the responsibility and then to know it's your karmic view of your mother because you're attached to not getting what it wants, then you can change your own mind. So don't worry about compassion yet. Start to look at yourself first. Change your mind. See it's your interpretation. And then you can begin to be grateful. Thanks, Mum, for what you did. And then love her for who she is, darling. Before she dies, she's going to be dead any minute. Love her for love her and thank her for being a good mum. Thank her. Thank her. Thank her. Say nice words in her ear. You know, you know what I'm saying? Truly. Yes. Even if she has been a creep. Yeah. You understand? <laughs> Just to be a, a fair. She has been a lovely mother. There you go. <laughs> that one time, right? It was that thing that happened. And you I mean because she gave you away and that you've never forgiven her for that, you mean? Because she, I know, that's, I know, I hear it. She came, 
we all came back together and, we, and then I had these memories. And so why did she leave in the first place? What was her reason for leaving? Because she was suffering in a marriage. And so she left, she left the marriage you the and the kids. And I was left behind with the, with the man in the house. And the, the father, house. your daddy. Not my father. Or her I husband. So how many children were there? Five. Oh, and she took four of them and left you. I Is that what you're saying? I was the only one left. She was exhausted. Sorry, what, I'm sorry, a bit confused. What happened to the other four? They were grown. Oh, I see. So you were a little girl. Little How old were you? Uh, 14. And he left, she left you with her, your stepfather. What happened to you? Yes. Oh, how fascinating. <laughs> the third one. From what I'm looking at now, the idea that she was exhausted. No, I know. I understand she that. To, I know. She couldn't, she couldn't do anything else. But of course, if you're 14 years old, you can't see all this and you're not to be expected to have understanding. So what? So then you have to. Look, I mean, again, the view of karma. Does the view of karma make sense to you? So you've got to look yeah. at that aspect. You've got to look at that aspect of it. That'll help you understand why it happened from your side. Stop looking at why your mother did it, because it's a very dynamic thing. The karma between you. You've got to right. understand that. Do you see my point? That's yes. a really important. Right. Step. That's what Before I'm trying you to go say. Anywhere near having now I got the egg on my face. I got to turn around and go. Okay. Now where you know just means whatever action you did in the past. Sit down, darling. Relax. It means, okay, so I always like to use the example. It's a bit an odd of an example to so compare with yours of when I had an abortion, but it's very similar. There's me. I was 23. I was in London and I thought, and, and I remember it was, um, and I was a hippie. I was a good hippie. That meant I, you know, had nice boyfriends. I did. I was a good hippie. I was very sincere. And every philosophy I had, I was very sincere. So there's this boy. And I remember I got pregnant, meaning, and I knew that second, often I tell people this because women often have this experience, you know, at that second, you know. And one of my friends recently, she said her daughter was staying with her and her husband in their house while their house was being built. And the daughter came down to breakfast and said, oh, mum, I'm pregnant. And she said, oh, when did you know? 40 minutes ago. And I, I knew that second. And this is the interesting point about karma now. This is how karma works. It's very dynamic. It's like you're in this tennis match together, whereas we think we're innocent victims. But there's no such thing. It's dependent or rising. So there we were. I was in this bed with this person. I knew some being came into my womb. I just knew it crystal clear. And my next thought, I'm going to have an abortion. So I didn't really like the boy. You know, I wasn't interested in him much. I'm going to have an abortion. This next thought. I'd never had that before or since. I didn't even kill creatures. So that's a very dynamic, very specific between two people. And this is the interesting point. The karmic view is the extent to which anything arises, even in my mind, about someone else. Or well, anything that happens to me in relation to someone else is mainly caused by my past action. So whatever action I had done to her, which meant I call her her, she was aborted 12 weeks, was caught by but the intensity of, but first of all, she was born in my womb, a human womb. She had a virtuous karma of non-killing be triggered before she passed away in the past life that programmed her to come to my womb. I didn't know about this boy yet, but the karma was triggered. She was waiting for me to hop into bed with this bloke then she came running. She got a human body. That's the fruit of her virtue. The second way karma ripened, I don't know what tendency she had because I didn't get, let the poor girl get life. Third, the experience similar to the cause of her past killing me, because karma's personal, babe, was that I had the thought. The second she came, I had the thought, I'll have an abortion. So then I felt very fortunate that the English it was in 1968 and the, the English had just legalized abortions for the national health. I felt fortunate. So it was very easy. No money. I walked to the hospital. The doctor agreed. They let me in. They gave me my private room and they cut this little thing out. But the poor thing didn't get cut out properly. So the poor karma she had was to be mangled. They had to do another DNC. I mean, just the karma of this little person in my womb. So it's a totally personal thing. So I did kill her. I got the doctor and the nurse to kill her. It's a fact. But she would not have been killed if she hadn't created the cause by having killed me. So you could not have been left by your mother. Equally, you could not have your mother ever leave you if you had not created the cause. So was a mother who's loving and kind and compassionate to their daughter till the day they die is because the daughter created that cause. But we always think we're innocent victims. We always think it's not fair. Why do bad things happen to me? And the fact of the matter is having the philosophical materialist view of the world, can, there's only one option. You're an innocent victim. At least with Jesus and God, you can and know he's got a plan. And have faith in him. There is no other option with a materialist view than to blame. Do you see my point? Yeah. 
with the view of karma, you really got to think about it. It's logic. It's not blame, not punishment, not reward. And then you think of the good thing, all the good things that have happened every millisecond of anything good. You created it, baby. But we only ever ask why do bad things happen? <laughs> ever. I've never had a person say to me, why do good things happen? We just take them for granted because of our hubris of attachment. I only deserve good things. And anger is I only don't deserve bad things. Oh, do you understand? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's me. Are we communicating? Oh, I love karma. I think it's a great view. It's the best I've heard so far in my life. It's the most viable. What do you think, darling? New person. Karma and purifying yes, karma. yes. And that's a concept I don't understand. We'll talk about that then. We'll talk about purification as well, shall we? Shall we do that? <coughs> okay. Well, that's why the Buddha's always talking about seeds and fruits. It's a great analogy, you know. And he's basically saying that we can pull out the weeds and grow the fruits. Think of it simply. You can pull out the seeds and you can grow the fruit, the flowers. So we can get rid of the delusions and then we can, get, we can grow the virtues. But also we can get rid of the, so every time we do an action, we leave a seed or an imprint or a tendency in our mind of the seeds and they're going to ripen as the suffering. So the, one of the first practices is to live in vows of non-killing. Do you understand? Which, which programs your mind very powerfully, like I said before. Okay, like I said just now, for and any action of say killing to be a main seed that's dropped into your bank vault that then will ripen eventually as a type of suffering rebirth. That only occurs when you meet the mouse, you have the intention, you have the motivation of anger, you do the action and the mouse dies. But how often is that going to happen? So, okay, so there's not that many killing, but equally with non-killing, we need lots of non-killing karmic seeds, okay? So the only time you're going to create non-killing karmic seed, again, as I say, you meet the mouse, you have an intention not to kill, you have compassion as a motivation, you do the action and then the result. But how often will that happen? Not often. So if you have a vow not to kill, the Buddha's saying, and Lama Zopa's saying, the vow pervades your mind continuously. And every second of the day, 24 hours a day, you're ticking over virtuous karmic seeds into your bank vault. And you need masses of virtuous karmic seeds in our mind. But 24 hours a day, even without having to meet the mouse. Are you communicating? So vows is one very powerful way to create lots of virtue and to purify the tendency to kill and to lie and to steal. It's a very easy way to create lots of virtue. Do you understand me? So the other practice is to purify karma. So, and there's, there's these practices we do at the end of the day called the four opponent powers. It's a purification practice. And it's basically a psychological process because there's no karma we can't change. There's no karma we can't get rid of. So living in vows of non-killing, non-harming, non-stealing is a very powerful way to program your mind to create virtue and to purify. They already purify the tendencies. It puts rockets, it puts atomic bombs under the tendency to kill and the tendency to lie. So that's already purification. But the other practice is to consciously engage in these four steps. The first one is you regret. So if I think of killing, I always think of this as abortion, right? So I regret the fact that I killed that little human being. Sure, she created the cause, but I did my part. I regret it, and this is a compassion for yourself. Because you know what, Rabina, I'll say, I don't want the future result. I don't want to get killed. I don't want to be born in a lower realm. Do you understand? I don't want to keep killing. So I regret it for my sake. I'm sick. It's like regretting because you're sick of diabetes. I regret eating that sugar. So you, you take responsibility for the action, and you think of the other actions you've done to harm sentient beings. And I say, I regret having done that because it sowed a seed in my mind, and if I leave it there, it's going to multiply and ripen as my future suffering. And I don't want suffering. So regret is your first step for your sake. Then you think, um, whom can I turn to? Where can I get the medicine, if you like, to purify my mind? Because I do the purification. So the second one is reliance. So we rely upon the Buddha. There's a purification. There's a meditation we do where we visualize above our head. Do you go on Zoom and go to practices and things? Because there's many, I mean, for example, our center in um, uh, Santa Fe, one nun, Venerable Katie, she leads this particular practice every evening at 9 p.m. 9 p.m., I think. Santa Fe time, 8 p.m. Pacific. So it's a 30 minutes. You can just, and you can, it's a really nice little practice. And it's very good to become familiar with it by doing somebody else leading it. Okay. 
you're very welcome to try that. I mean, you ask people about it. <laughs> so the second, first one is you acknowledge that you did this and that, and you're sick of suffering. And you think of all the things you must have done that you don't remember, because they left seeds in your mind. That's just the way it is. And you don't want them to ripen. You're sick of suffering. Then you think, well, whom can I turn to? You visualize Buddha above your head. There's a certain meditation we do. We delight that you found this doctor whose methods you're going to use to purify yourself. And that's the difference with the Christian teachings as well. I'm not being rude about it. God, you see, because a sin is doing what God said not to do, this is the major point. You've got to ask God to forgive you, isn't it? Because forgiveness is what purifies you. Do you see my point? And that's why we speak a lot about forgiveness in our culture. So here, because Buddha's not, you know, you don't get your doctor to forgive you for smoking. Do you see my point? That's not the point. That's not forgiveness. You don't go to your doctor and say, please forgive me for smoking and then hope you won't get cancer. Forgiveness has got nothing to do with it. Buddha would forgive you. He's a very compassionate person. But the point is that you, because you're relying upon the Buddha to give you the methods, but you're doing the work. You do the regretting because you did the killing. You then want to change it because you're sick of suffering. And now you rely upon the Buddha. And the second step, you now also have compassion for those you harmed. So I think of this person in my womb due to her karma. She got killed by me. I have compassion. I have compassion for the doctors and nurses who did, my, who did the job for me. Do you understand? And I have compassion for anybody I've harmed because they don't want to suffer either. Third, you do some practice. You visualize, you say mantra, and you imagine purifying. And it's your mind purifying your own mind. You do the purifying. A particular visualization, you visualize nectar. It's a very nice little visualization. And you say mantra. And then the fourth one is you make a decision, resolve to change. This is the four steps. It's very psychologically very powerful because there's no karma you can't change. So living in vows, living a moral life, studying the teachings, doing your purification every day. Honey child, you have got so much virtue. You can put your feet up all day and eat popcorn and watch Netflix. Are we communicating? All right, darling. It's all there in the teachings. Yep. Go, sweetheart. We've been thinking about mm. animals and how, how can they get out of the animal realm? Oh. That's, a, that's a tragedy. How can there's nothing an animal can do animal basically the animal <laughs> one of the sufferings of leave it there just leave, keep it keep it keep it one of the sufferings of being an animal isn't it the suffering is this very constricted narrow mind isn't it there's not much option there's not much option you can't they don't have much intelligence not being rude about animals to do any changing the karma is so intense that they don't have much choice but to just follow really in, i mean we're bad enough following our karma we're like little lemmings you know at least we've got access to virtue. That's the saving grace of being human. We have access to intelligence and choice and virtue if we're fortunate. Animals don't have the luxury, you know. So the tragedy is there's nothing they can do to get themselves out of it. So that's where we can help animals by protecting them from killing, like pets and things, and also by leaving imprints in their mind of the Buddhas by saying mantras, and this can be very beneficial for them. But as an animal, you can't do much, you know. Forget hell beings and lower realms and other beings, there are billions of them can't do much when you're really suffering because your mind is so intensely suffering. And this is where it's very shocking because we don't think our cute little poodle is suffering because we only think of the first kind of suffering. So Lama Zopa said one time, you know, that if you could just for a few moments have a direct insight into the mind of your cute little dog whom you think is so gorgeous, whom you think is so adorable, and they probably are adorable, but if you can have an insight into their mind, the le and I'm saying more words here, the level of their profound ignorance, their profound ego grasping, and the fear and suffering of that mind would be, if you just could have a moment of that experience, the suffering would be so intense, you'd never want to waste another millisecond of your precious human life. Now, that is very shocking to us. We don't see that. You just see a cute animal. You understand? And so all that, oh, the Lama Zobah is making it up. Or he's like these holy beings who've gone to the depths of his own mind and can see at a subtler level the intensity of the suffering of other beings, you know, human as well. So the level of suffering the Buddha's talking about is way more subtle than we could ever imagine. This is the only thing I can conclude from that, you know. Do you understand? What else, people? Anybody on Zoom has something to say? No? Nothing hello, Venerable Romina. Yes, hello, Denise. Talk to me, darling. Fantastic to see you. Thank you. Um, in the in the four opponent powers i think that there are four r's and i missed the third r okay the first r is regret the second r is reliance and that includes refuge and compassion for others the third is the remedy remedy do the practice the remedy and the fourth is 
the resolve to not do again. All right. Thank you. So, but let me now talk a little bit more about it. Like I said before, there are four ways that karma ripens. <clears throat> One is a lower realm rebirth, like I said, from the negative actions. One is the tendency to keep doing the action, which is the worst. That boy, that fisherman, he spent his life killing and he didn't know it was negative because he just got pleasant feelings from it because of his past habit. So it was pleasure for him, you know, this is a tragedy. So he didn't know he was harming. He didn't mean, you know, he didn't go out there viciously trying to harm the fish. That's the suffering of attachment. It seems like attachment looks nice, but because it's so intense and it paints a pretty picture, he couldn't see the suffering he was causing every day. That's the tragedy. So the tendency to keep doing it, the act, having it done to you called experience similar to the cause, the way we're seen and treated in this life. So my, my little, you know, my sentient being in my womb, she got killed. This boy, the fisherman, died young, scuba diving. And the fourth is it called environmental karma, which is the way the physical world impacts upon you. So the four results of killing, lower realm rebirth, tendency to kill, getting killed, and being sick and un unhealthy. Or the, world, the physical world impacts upon you negatively. The water's polluted. You get sick all the time. You get diseases. The food is polluted. Look at the world, you know. Look at the world. This is the fruit of collective killing from countless lives ago, all of us together. So they flip it over to non-killing. You, you're born as a human. You won't have any thought to kill. You won't even meet an opportunity in which you have to choose to kill. You won't get killed or die young and you'll be fat and healthy and eat whatever you like. So who doesn't at least forget Nirvana, forget Buddhahood, who at least doesn't want that. So if at least that reason, be a nice person, please, and back off and leave sentient beings alone and stop harming them. That's Buddha's solution because we create that. Isn't it? Do you understand? So now, this is the point now, these four opponent powers, each of them purifies specifically each of the four ways that karma ripens. Listen, I, I always have course notes on this, but I was lazy this weekend and didn't do your course notes. So I'm going to have to send you, Bay, some course notes, and I want you to put them online and people can get them. I'll have teachings on karma, teachings about the mind, teachings about compassion, teachings about emptiness, okay? Atma, you can have all that. So a little just a PDF, and you can, you can get it to the people. It'll all be there, and the meditation as well, and medit on, on purification. So the first one, regretting killing, this is a very tasty one. Let's say I'm in my practice, I'm regretting. Let's say, okay, let's say that day at work, somebody didn't believe my words. Let's say they thought, Rabina, you you know, like, you know, like the person on Zoom earlier, I know it was this morning, India, 5.30, can't remember. Never mind. Um, so let's say uh, someone's mean to me at work. And you come home, you're really upset because you know you didn't lie, but they don't believe your words. And you're so distressed, you can't believe it. So then when you realize karma, like with you, you know, you realize that you must have done something in that you must have lied in the past, in the past life. And this person, due to your past karma, even if you're telling the truth, she doesn't believe you. And you think, oh, you, you can't bear it. You're so full of pain. So what do you do? You then, by regretting, so you sit on your cushion that night and you regret from the depths of your heart, whatever lying you must have done to that person in whichever life it was, 42 lives ago, you regret kill the lying and you know you say, why? Because I don't want the suffering. And you know you don't want the suffering. It's happening right now. And don't be surprised if you do that every day. Just start believing you again. It changes it. It purifies it. It purifies. By regretting killing and stealing and lying, that purifies that karma called experiences similar to the cause which is how you're seen and treated by others. The second one, refuge and compassion, purifies environmental karma, you know. <clears throat> uh, there's a, Especially with sentient beings, I think, you know, you're harming others. So then they say the very ground that you fall down on that harms you is the same ground that you rely upon to stand up. So the very sentient beings you've harmed, you, you need them in order to have compassion, you know. That's how they talk. So this environmental karma is purified by the second, the reliance. The third, the remedy, that purifies the lower realms. Fourth one, resolve to not do it again, obviously purifies the tendency, and that's the most important. Okay. 
I think karma is such a great teaching. You're really trying to get it on the earth, you know, not read it in 10th century Indian texts. If you're 10th century Indian, it's fine. It's fine, you know, but it's so ab abstract and arcane. It's hard to get your head around it, isn't it? Well, I mean, I say it in Australian voice, so you have to have it in American voice, isn't it? It's enough, people. We've said enough, surely. No? What is it? 3.30, okay. So what I'm getting, I started with compassion, right? So this, without all this, how can you have compassion for anybody? You can't. So even unless you've done, it's sort of like, compassion is like university level. Junior school and high school is the wisdom wing. You can't go to university physics if you haven't done one plus one is two in, in high school. You've got to prepare your mind then. I mean, we all love compassion. Oh, yeah, poor sentient beings. But it's too kind of emotional compassion. You've got, you're not qualified for the level of compassion that is now realizing because you know what causes your suffering. Now you know why sentient beings do what they do. Instead of just criticizing them, you're not having compassion for a few dogs and ants, you know. You then have compassion for everybody. We're all in the same boat. Then you have some courage, you know. Do you understand, people? So one step at a time. So don't have compassion for your mum yet. Look at yourself first. Then it's easy because you know that you and your mum are in this thing together. Do you understand? You're in this thing. It's interdependent. So powerful of you, you know. It softens everything. Then it's easy to love her and forgive her. It's easy. Can't force that one. Do it first. Karma first for yourself. And to be fair, she Go. has lost two children to cancer. And she has seen that in front of her. No, no, I'm not. I'm not ever thinking she's bad. I'm just talking from your perspective. I just, I, and and I have learned from that lesson of I've oh. seen her be compassionate, and so my mind would say she's not compassionate. But I have seen she's compassionate. No, no, but the thing so is, my mind's lying. I know, but that's not for you. It's not the point yet. You've got to look at the karmic one first. This is how you get compassion for you. Know that you are the cause. It didn't happen innocently. It didn't happen wrongly. Most of the pain we have is it's not fair. Why did it happen to me? Once you get over that, yeah. compassion is easy to have. Understanding another person is easy peasy falling off a log. Do you understand, darling? Karma is a very powerful one. We miss it, I think, a lot in our culture because we misunderstand it. We just think it's another version of punishment, you know, and it's so heavy. It's, it's, a, it's a miraculous view. I think it's amazing. And it's been around for 3,000 damn years, you know, just that we've never heard it before. We think it's new. Ridiculous. Okay, you people, I think it's enough to go home. Come on. What? Where? Who? More questions? Why, oh, sweetheart, go talk. Talk to me. Oh, yeah, what's here? What is there? Who is there? I think Christine asked, can Venerable Robina talk, uh, speak on social issues, for example, prejudice and racism? How can we reflect this in our personal of course, practice? That's a really good topic. It's important. Yeah. To want to go out and help the world, that's compassion. How incredible. Get out there. Help the world. You know, help your people. If your people are Israelis, help your Israelis. If your people are Palestinians, help them. If your people, you know, are the people around the corner who are this and that, help them. Help whoever needs helping. It's incredible, you know, amazing to want to help people. <coughs> but, of course, the framework we see, as we call it, social or political issues through is the framework of innocent victims and wicked harmers. It's a very strong view. I mean, I know well from my 10 intensive years of political activity before I became a Buddhist, you know. Well, first hippie, and I blamed all the straight people. Then I was at radical lefty communist politics, seriously, seriously involved, you know, demonstrating. I, I lived on the dole. What do you mean? You lived on like welfare, working full time for political issues, going around demonstrating, getting arrested on, what, what, not Wall Street, pol, uh, what's it called? Downing Street, dragged by four policemen, one on each limb, me screaming. You know, they threw me in a bus. I got thrown into prison. I said to my sister, don't pay the fine. She did. I was so upset. 30 pounds. I was 30, like $30 the fine, you know, for whatever I did in this demonstration against the, it was the Irish. Remember the Irish thing in 1971? The, the, the 13 people who got killed and there was a massive demonstration in London. I'll never forget it. And I wasn't doing anything naughty. I just got in the way of the policeman, you know. And then, of course, as soon as he tried me to go away, I tried to bugger off. And that was the end of me. So that was all these things. So intensive political activity for like two or three years. I didn't have a proper job. 
was full time working political activity, and then I got involved in black politics. The time of the Black Panthers. My friend Mary was a literary agent who was George Jackson's literary agent. Remember George Jackson? The, you know these people. You don't know any of these time. The Soledad brothers, George Jackson, this Black Panther who was in prison in the like late 60s, early 70s. And he was very famous for this book he wrote, his letters, you know, Soledad brother. It was like a really a, a cause celebre at the time. And we, for a year, ran this organisation in London. We had been demonstrations, 100,000 people. We invited people to talk like James Baldwin, all these famous people. And then I heard the word feminist. I thought it was feminist. I'd never heard of it before, you know. Feminist. I thought, oh, I... then I heard feminist. Then I heard radical feminist. Oh, I like radical. So I slowly I became a radical feminist. And then, of course, being extreme and radical, you know, I then inevitably had to give up boys and I became a radical lesbian feminist. You had to go in that direction. There's nowhere else to go with radical feminism. Everything I did was radical. So then I became radical lesbian separatist feminist. Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> Where all males, by definition, were the cause of the universe's suffering. So men were not needed. So we even lived, I lived for a while with my friend who'd bought a piece of property and she called it Amazon Acres. Amazon Acres. And only women lived there. Even if you were even six years old and you were not a girl, you were not allowed. We were serious, serious feminists. So then I exhausted all options. By that point, I'd blamed all the non-Catholics when I was a Catholic for the suffering. Then I blamed all the straight people. Then I blamed all the rich people. Then I blamed all the white people. Then I blamed all the male people. Well, there was no one left on the planet. <laughs> I promise you, I'd done my due diligence and I had exhausted all options for who to blame for the suffering of the world. So then I thought I'd start finding a spiritual path again. You know, I'd been a Catholic. I'd given it up 10 years before. So I started martial arts and I thought I'd found my path. And then Mr. Bill Bright ran over my foot. I'm so grateful to him. I was helping these women. I was doing karate full time. I thought I'd found my path. And I was helping these women push their car across the intersection. And this fellow somehow ran over my left foot. I just, that's my foot, nothing else. And I, I felt it crack. The fifth metatarsal broke. I broke my fifth metatarsal in this foot two years ago. All it took was a twist. This one took a car to run over it. So it shows old age, you know. So anyway, this fellow, he came up to me. And, he, and I said, I screamed. I said, you ran over my foot. <coughs> and he said, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. And his name was Bill Bright. And I sued him. I was in plaster. I couldn't do karate anymore. I was devastated. And then I went to a cafe in Melbourne and I saw this poster and I said, Lama Yeshi. And I thought, I'm convinced. And even now I'm convinced I'd heard his name before. Of course I hadn't. Karmic connection. So that, I met Lamas. I went to the course two months. Lamas open, Lama Yeshi. And that started then, you see. So what am I saying is, I finally, yeah, they started to tell me that you have to look at your mind. And I'd never heard of that before. Don't look at the outside world. Look at your mind, Rabina. So that was the change. That was the shift that I've been doing ever since, you know. I don't know why I told you all that all of a sudden, but I did. question was on racism, I think. What? What happened? Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, I forgot. My mind's wandering off. I'm so sorry. So it's okay. Thank you. So all of that is incredible. was a very, for my part, very powerful part of my process and, and a part of understanding the world and seeing the suffering of the world. But all the time, of course, the framework was who to blame was this nobility of an innocent victim called a black person, an innocent victim called a female person, an innocent victim called an animal. Always innocent victims. We have to have an innocent victim and a wicked, naughty oppressor. And I'm not, being, I'm not being sarcastic because on a relative level, it's true there is sexism. It is true there is racism. This is not wrong. But there's a more nuanced way using the Buddha's view to look at it, which, of course, initially is shocking because we don't want to think that the person created the cause to suffer. As soon as we hear that if you suffer and you must have created the cause, this is too heavy for our minds. We can't cope with that. But I find the Tibetans a great example. They're the best political activists you can find, but they have the view of karma. They're not angry with the Chinese. They know why the Chinese have taken their country, that they created the cause 47 lifetimes ago. So they're not blaming, but they know that it's not right. Relatively speaking, it's unjust. So they demonstrate. There's no contradiction between understanding karma and having compassion and wanting to make the world a better place. Nothing wrong. 
So whatever turns you on, honey, whatever thing, I don't mean that sarcastically, whatever group of people you have a connection with, help them, definitely. And you don't have to walk around saying, oh, well, this is all your fault. You created it. No. When you come to, if you're an oncologist and I come to you with my cancer, I don't need you, I don't need you giving me lectures about oncology. I need you to show compassion. So I don't need, you know, if I'm a feminine, if I'm a woman being abused by a male, I don't need you coming along telling me that I created the cause and it's all my fault. That's not how you work with karma. Karma helps you have a view of why the world is the way it is. And then you have compassion for people. It informs your ability to have compassion, more compassion. Because, you know, we're all in the same boat. You don't see it initially necessarily. And you help people have courage. So if that woman comes to you ab abused by some boy, have compassion for her. And tell him to leave the, this idiot. You know, so compassion shows many aspects. So how amazing. Help the world. Go demonstrate. You know, but don't expect things to change overnight. Don't hold your breath. I don't know if that helped. And I forgot your question. I'm sorry. I always wander off into my own silly stories. I'm so sorry. But that's the one, you know. The world is suffering. There's no question. Racism is true. Sexism is true. Poverty is true. People are evil. People are negative. It's a fact. There is greed. There is. A, it is true. It's true. Due to karma, yes, but it's true. So do what you can to help. As a, as Martin Luther, not yeah, Martin Luther King. I didn't like him initially. I thought he was a bit soft and weak. I like Malcolm X. But I've just seen recently a lovely book that says they really came to the same point, and they do. They're very amazing, both of them. So Martin Luther King said. It is good to be angry. It is good to, meaning to see fault. Look at the suffering. Look at the injustice. But then you say, what can I do to help? Whereas instead of saying, how dare they do that and shout and yell. It's no good at all. It doesn't help. What can I do to help? That's compassion. So go out there and demonstrate and help the world. No question. All right, Christine. Who was it, Christine or Catherine? Christine. Does that help, Christine? What does she say? That was wonderful, venerable. Thank you so much. Good, sweetheart. Good, care, Christine, darling. Happy to see you. Who? That's enough. I think we finished. Not we go home. Yeah, go on. Go talk to me. Go, please, sweetheart. Go, Marita. Go talk. Mary, who's Mary Beth? Talk to me. Okay, I have a question. Um, when we talk about uh, karma and purification, most often I hear the example is about killing, but yes. we have many other things. Yes, yeah, true. And the one I've been struggling with is just lately, I've been very uh, like lethargic in my practice, like no okay. enthusiasm. And then yeah. I sit down at night, do the Vajrasattva. And yeah. it's just like, I'm just saying, oh, you know, I want to purify my this um, lethargy or lack of enthusiasm. And it almost feels like it's reinforcing it. Like, Lethargy. Instead of purifying, I hear you, darling. I do hear you. Now, lethargy is a very strong one, darling. Let's talk about it. It's a very good point, Mary Beth. Because it seems so innocuous, doesn't it? Because it doesn't go around. It's not harming others. So let's look at lethargy. Let's look. It's sort of like uh, knowing, as you said, no enthusiasm, isn't it? So let's look at enthusiasm. As we know on the body side for path, there's these six practices once you've achieved body once you've got renunciation once you've got bodhicitta you then bop along from life after life after life with this enormous enthusiasm with this practice of these six perfections generosity patience uh, generosity morality patience and perseverance and then that's the that's the completion of the compassion wing life after life after life working with sentient beings in relation to sentient beings those four and then the last two shamatha and, and vipassana in your meditation. So you get, that's the, that's the wisdom wing. And the completion of these six is what they call Buddhahood. So, okay, the fourth of those is the most important. And it seems a bit abstract. Say They call it joyful effort. I mean, that just sounds like ridiculous. Joyful effort or enthusiasm or perseverance. They're all referring to the same thing. And so when we, and so we think, well, how do you get that? It's really hard to know. But when we understand Mary Beth, the opposite that really explains it to us. So let's discuss it, okay? And the opposite, shockingly enough, is called laziness. And then we get completely guilty when we hear that. 
So when there are levels of laziness. So the Lamas talk about them differently, but I'm speaking it this way, which is a variation of the way they say it, but it's essentially saying the same thing. So the way I like to say it is the very first level of laziness, and listen to it carefully, we all understand it, is can't be bothered. Isn't it, Mary Beth? You can't be bothered. And then you've got to ask the question, and this is really important, what is it you can't be bothered doing? Guess what? Is the thing that takes effort. But listen, what is it that takes effort is exactly what your attachment doesn't want. Attachment is the problem, Mary Beth. And attachment mostly here is to comfort. I mean, it's to the comfort zone, our comfort zone, emotionally and physically. This is such a deep attachment. It's We sink into this, this kind of inertia, you know, this lethargy, as you say. So the very first level is can't be bothered because to go again, but when we understand that to achieve a goal, by definition, a goal is something that you haven't achieved before. That means you can't achieve it unless you make effort. And effort means going against this inertia that says can't be bothered. You, but, and so as the, all the lamas say, the only reason you're going to make effort is when you know the benefits of the result and that's but it's 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 easy to see the benefit of going on a diet talking about samsara it's easy to see the benefit of you know of having a better job it's easy to see the benefit of going to the gym and even then we get lazy can't put you know put it off but we've got to know the benefit of working on our mind and having a practice it's not that easy but that's only the first one mary beth the next one which is really tricky which is really sneaky is you you say Oh, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. This is one of our worst crimes. Then we end up like a tortoise carrying around all these burdens of undone jobs that we think we'll do later, but which is a lie because later never comes. And then all you do is build, and this is the trouble, when you keep putting things off, all you do is build up incredible aversion to the job and you just can't bear to do it. So, And so again, look at the logic. One is first arises, you see the job you want to do, you practice or whatever it is. And then instantaneously you can't be bothered. But then you say, oh, it's okay, I'll do it later. And you feel relief, like you got yourself off the hook. But it's a lie. You're cheating yourself because you, we, you feel relieved, like as if you haven't really just said, I can't be bothered doing it, oh, but I'll do it later. It's okay. But you're lying to yourself because it won't come. Later never comes. And all it does is build up aversion. And by the time you get to start to do it, you build up this aversion in your mind and you can't stand the sight of your cushion. So it makes it 20 times harder to break the habit. This is a real terrible one. The lamas all say the most, the most one of the worst ways to die is to die with this thought of all the things you regret not having done, that you should have, that you wanted to do. You know, it's very sad. And then the third one seems a bit odd, but it's very logical. It's it's the one, it's the worst laziness. It says, oh, I'm not capable. I can't achieve that. And that's and that's a lie because we can. You just got to see it as dependent arising. And, and so then we feel like we're completely off the hook now. It almost feels like we think it's humility, but it's not. It's just the bone laziness. Can't, can't be bothered. I'll do it later. And I, anyway, I'm not capable. So we build up all this. So then no wonder we have inertia. And then we build up this aversion to the job and it takes you years to get back to the habit. So we just have to persevere with it, not expect any joy, but have the discipline of just doing it, just doing it. Do you understand, Mary Beth? No choice. Just keep doing it and try to see the benefits and try to see the benefit. Long-term benefit is the point, but try to even see the benefit now by having the discipline and doing it every day and rejoice in your effort. Rejoice that you're doing it. Lift your mind a little bit, you know. What do you think? I think it's it's very helpful. I mean, I am still doing it, but it's the enthusiasm piece that I'm lacking. So I think the I know. best... So but so listen what? to me, my feeling is that means the joy. You mean there's no joy in it, right? Yeah, I'm just kind of reading the prayers and getting it done. No, I, okay, okay, getting it done. I know this is, a, so this is a very powerful one, okay? We know when you're doing something you're attached to, like you settle down to watch a movie you really want to watch, sit with your feet up, put Netflix on, get your popcorn or your meal. You're really involved in it and you're excited to do it and you don't want it to end, isn't it? 
because yeah. we're attached to it. So this is the problem. Then we do our duty and we rush through it because all we're doing is anticipating going to bed uh, or waiting for the end. So the other thing, the extra thing to do there, we have to really reprogram our mind to say, I want to, I and to, I don't want to, just to try and not buy into, because that's a version, Mary Beth, that's a version to the practice. You do it, but there's a version to the practice. And I understand your point. So we've really got to shift that and try to say, well, I want to do it. Train your mind to say, I want to do my practice. I want to enjoy it and try to go a bit more slowly and be patient and humble with yourself and try not to, to rush through because that just makes more anxiety. That just forces, and there's no benefit. It just causes anxiety. So you've got to try to practice enjoying it, practice not resisting it, practice not having aversion notice the aversion because that'll build up to a big tension at some point just doing it and then you get so lazy at some point you just blur you know i know that one it's very powerful because we we can't expect that we're going to get joy from it because we're not highly realized meditators but we've got to say i want to do it train yourself to say those words feel the pressure to push through it feel the pressure to rush and go against that darling and train your mind to say i want to do it i want to get a flavor from this again and be a bit more sweet with it train yourself it's really difficult but darling it's possible i promise mary beth do you understand thank you, thank good. you very much good good sweetheart I understand. I really do. Okay. Time to go home. I think, isn't it? Yeah. But I promise I'll send these PDFs to you. One for the phone and one for the eighth, one for the one for the tablet. Okay, darling people. It's been a very nice day. Thank you so much. We covered a few things, didn't we? For our sake and the sake of others. Never give up. Keep practicing at the level you're practicing. Keep rejoicing in your practice. Keep seeing your mind, keep controlling your body and speech, keep knowing it, it's possible, keep identifying with your potential and never give up, never give up, never give up, okay? Let's just do the dedication, little dedication prayer. We've got online. Can we offer mandala? What, sweetheart? Can we offer mandala to you? Okay, go on, offer the mandala. So do that, the little prayer that Bay is going to lead, which is a sort of offering a mandala, it's just visualizing all the contents of the universe and offering to the Buddha as a request, as a, as a thank you for the teachings. Like offering a gift. There it is, go. We do in English or English? Tibetan, as you wish. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, or Tibetan. Go on. English is fine, darling. English go. Is fine. Okay. go, sweetheart. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. May my vulnerable Lama's life be firm, his white divine actions spread in the ten directions. May the torch of the teachings of Losang always remain, dispelling the darkness of all beings in the three realms. And now we just say these little prayers here. You see them. Go on, you lead them, darling. You say the dedication prayer. Go. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhisattva that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that wish has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And we say the prayer for long Dalai Lama to live long life. He promises he's going to live another 30 years. Let's just pray for that. Want that? Go. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. To the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously. So that we did the prayer. We did the prayer already of the chanting of all those names for the mm -hmm. for Lamas to come back quickly. So okay. that will do for that one. That's wonderful. Okay. So okay. That'll do. That's enough. Thank you, everybody. So kind. Never give up. Keep moving. It's all he can say. It's all he can say. I mean, I, I sound so silly, but I always think even if you're drowning, you might as well stay perky. Because then if you're staying perky, you might find an opportunity to stop drowning. But if you panic, then you're finished, you know. So no matter what happens, try and stay perky. That's enthusiasm. That's enthusiasm. You've got to try and have that. No matter how bad things get, it's all right. There's always a chance to something come out of it. Then you stay optimistic. And then you begin useful to others, I promise. Okay, darlings. Thank you.